Welcome to the Business Week Show. When my colleagues and I thought about what kind of themes of the magazine we want to turn into episodes of the show, we spoke about envy, failure, feuds, family, heists, generosity, legends, risk, rivals. And then we had a really far out idea. Moonshots. We reached out to many different kinds of people, including like actual real NASA astronauts. The first person that we talked to is a billionaire who is spending $100 million to try to cure a rare kind of muscular dystrophy that he has called FSHD by the year 2027. His name is Chip Wilson. He's the founder of Lululemon, and that is one of the most valuable apparel brands in the world today. But when we heard about his life and his career and his feelings about honesty and one extremely serious example of dishonesty, we decided to shoot for the moon. So, tonight's episode is built around one interview and built around the moonshots of one person who doesn't totally think they're really moonshots at all. Here is Chip Wilson. Chip, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Max. You've written about feeling kind of disgusted. In, in business and in life by, I think, what you call mediocrity. You know, and that's like complaining or caution or like wallowing in embarrassment, wallowing in shame. What you want instead is, I think, what you describe as a kind of like radical, like ra a radical greatness. What has the idea of moonshots meant to you and, and to your career? I never really thought of moonshots ever. Like, so, I mean, you're bringing this up. I, and I guess Peter Diamandis from uh, Singularity University and fame in the X Prize would have been kind of the, the master of this kind of idea about having an idea that could make a billion dollars, affect a billion people in the world. Um, and so what is that? And how do, how do you exponentially, like, uh, set your company or yourself on that trajectory to get there? And, of course... The big ways are setting a firm goal with a buy win date and conditions for satisfaction, and then putting action in place in order to get there. Am I right though, even if, even if you're not thinking about it as moonshots, am I thinking that sort of maybe your life has been built around this idea of, of really kind of loathing um, like, like, an, like an acceptance of mediocrity and that what you want instead is to, is to put yourself in a position to make kind of the impossible possible, which is, I guess, my, my, how, I, how I think about moonshots. Yeah, I think more like I almost feel sorry for people that get to the near the end of their life and they go, oh my God, my life is over and I really didn't go for it. And uh, something that we'll talk about maybe later is this thing about... Um, looking at life from the stands rather than playing on the court. By the year 2030, I think you've said you'll be unable to walk by yourself. You're about 18 months now into, I think there's a five-year window for the 100 million US dollar goal. Right. How is this new moonshot, if, that, if that's a fair word for it, how, how, how is it going? I would say it's phenomenal. Before um, 2018, when we really started thinking about this solve FSHD model that we have right now, myself and a, and a man named Neil Camarda, who was the ex-CEO of uh, Shell Oil in Canada, who all, family also has this, we belonged to a, uh, a firm out of the Netherlands called Fasio, and it was like the only thing dealing with FSHD in the world, and we went through about six or seven years of it and 30, 40 million dollars and nothing really came out of it. I got to the point where my muscular dystrophy was going, telling me like, oh my God, like I can't pretend like it's not gonna happen anymore. Like it's really starting to affect me. So I went, okay, I gotta put some action in place to make this happen. And I had been studying Peter Diamandis' model about how to set up a hundred million dollar prize and then what that does. And what it does is it brings everybody out of the woodwork. One, you get a lot of publicity for it. Uh, there's funding there and, and people go, you know, I have an idea that I think can be attributed and help FSHD or maybe even cure it. But there was a lot of steps that had to get there to do that. So um, I th hopefully that 
gave you the foundation of where it came from. You were diagnosed when you were, I think, like, like 32. Right. Which before Lululemon. I'm wondering if maybe an idea that there was something wrong going on, if, if that subconsciously put a kind of internal pressure to sort of be great in the years, in the years ahead, and that even, it, even if you weren't thinking about it, somehow it pressured you to do something like kind of, kind of extraordinary. I would never compare myself to Steve Jobs, but I often thought about, about that about Steve, like whether internally he knew something was going on and he had to make things happen. Um, I don't think that was necessarily it for me. I think I got diagnosed with it. I think I'm a very lucky person in that I have a very slow moving one. There's, there's thousands of, of children in wheelchairs who have it. I mean, and then I go, well, why was I so lucky to have a slow moving one? I was always an athlete, I mean like three or four hours a day my whole life. And so I think I was lucky to have this part of it kind of repress that, that the, the, I guess the inflammation that occurs in the expression of the, the epigenetics of the expression of the mm. DNA. So I feel like I, my, I feel I've been very lucky to have been born with the athletic like love, but on the other hand, I have this problem. And I, I know that you consider yourself lucky, yeah, yeah, and, I know, and I know that you like to uh, think about yourself as, as a player on the field, um, and, and that you were a, a triathlete, and you swam, and you worked out, I think, like two or three times a day. Sure. Sounds very stressful to me. <laughs> but I'd like to try to channel, if, if, if it's true, the feelings that, I don't know, the feelings that I live with, you know, for, for no particular reason, feelings of like, uh, like self-pity and, uh, and anger or regret. You know, the, the, the common sort of ugliness of life. H have you gotten in touch with, with some of those things of, over the last couple of years? Oh yeah, I, I definitely lived that life a lot till I was 40. And I think that um, I did a couple of things. I mean, I, I went through that period of like self-reflection at the age of 40, um, read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, The Psychology of Achievement by Tracy, I took the landmark form course, uh, read the book Good to Great by Jim Collins, and these things kind of formed a new Chip Wilson, so to speak, and it reframed who I was and how I was going to move forward. So I, I was able to like very easily now uh, flex this muscle called amnesia, <laughs> and amnesia is something where I, where it's like waking up in the morning and I have no past, and if you have no past then interestingly enough, you have no future. You sing a slightly different tune in the memoir. You are very clear that you're really future oriented. And you describe uh, kind of beautifully like this way of like, you do kind of talk about like living in the future. And I associate, that's one reason why I think about you and Moonshot. So I'm, I'm curious to ask about the way in which you can put yourself in the future and the way in which, you know, I guess your success has afforded you an ability to, to try to change your future. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you still feel as, as future-oriented as, as you used to. Oh, I'm def definitely there. I, I think the best way to affect life in the present is to determine what, the f what my future is going to be. So I set goals for one, five, ten years out. I have a 30-year vision of what my life wants to, you know, I want it to look like. And I work back from that 30-year vision to set my 10, 5, and 1-year goals. And I put action thing, actions in place in order to get there, and I get the life that I want to live. Do you feel that you've ever been disappointed that, that the, the, pre, the present did, that doesn't turn out to be what, what, what you thought the future would hold? I don't mind failing 50% of the time at my goals. I think failing is a muscle that very few people get used to, are, are used to now. It's in people talk about stress and mental illness. No, it's just a failure, and it's a failure to be dealt with. And I think people that learn how to deal with failure learn how to reset goals, reset conditions of satisfaction, new dates, and get on with life. What's the connection to stress and mental illness? Do you think that sometimes people misinterpret what's really the same? Well, I just, I just, I mean, we've all heard of this thing called helicopter parents that have taken care of kids and doing everything for them. 
uh, never let them fail, never let them have any adversity. You know, I think that that's the worst thing parents can do, and I think we're going through an epidemic right now. All right, but you know, that's ironic though, because it was your dad who told you, I think at a swimming pool, yeah. that instead of saving your energy in a race for like later on, the, the final laps, that you should go all out. Will you tell us more about the poolside theory that, that your dad gave you? And I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's like, it's, uh, it, it's yeah. important to your life. Yeah. It's really critical. Everybody in that era, it seemed like in the 60s or 70s, it was kind of like, there was always this thing about looking good at the end of the race, like sprinting the last 100 meters in a, in a running race or in the swim race, going to the end and hitting the wall and going, Whoa. but there would, nobody really like went full out at the beginning. And of course, it's very common now in, in Olympics. You can see everybody doing it. But at the time, it was it was... It was rare. And so to actually like decide to go full out and fully commit, you know, had me get a Canadian record. I think it was the number two time in the world at the time. And, um, and I went, wow, you know, like what? So now I became actually fearful, which is kind of an interesting way of being, of going through life and doing things and not committing 100%. Hmm. I never wanted to get to my deathbed and go, I only gave that idea 97%. If I would have done 3% more, would I have done it? And would life have shown up mm. differently? I never want to be on my deathbed regretting a thing. Chip, C CEOs are not known for saying, um, for saying what they really think. And they're not known for being willing to, to, to be themselves. You printed your own manifesto of sayings on, right. on the, I think on the, the actual Lululemon bag. Right. Um, you know, it included one, I think, that people ended up getting upset about. It's about children, children of the orgasm of life, I right, think. Right. Um, you wrote in your memoir that I think you said something along the lines of like, I'd rather see a child have a job than just waste away. Right. And then um, in an interview with a, with a colleague a colleague here, you said, I think, some women's bodies um, just actually don't work for, for Lululemon right. pants. What is the point for you of... I'm talking like so brashly. Well, I think it's the it was the culture of Lou Lemon to be totally open and undefended, and to have every discussion was out on the table. I think especially when you are are dressing people, and you're looking at all the different types of bodies and the different personalities that want different colors, different shapes, different everything. I mean, there's one billion nuances that have to occur and things like that. But really it's the psychology of like looking at people and determining who the muse is, who's actually gonna buy your product, but almost as importantly, who do you not want to have buying your product? And, uh, and can a brand be everything to everybody? Does that become the gap? Well, I never wanted to become the gap and I, Certainly didn't want to become like most failed, quite frankly, American apparel companies. I wanted to be distinct. I wanted to, to my, my market was a very healthy um, person that was interested in fun and longevity and community. And that's who my market was. We do not need to re relitigate that, the comment about, about pants. But I, I mean, I guess that I could sort of imagine that maybe you've learned that like it, you know, it just like hurt people's feelings, that, that people felt left out and they felt left out uh, because of things they can't control. Maybe you wouldn't say the same thing nowadays. No, I, I don't think so. I think, you know, like, let's, let's face it here. I, I probably had done hundreds and hundreds of interviews and said thousands and thousands of things. It's just the roll of the dice, the odds that I would say something that was very truthful that is going to affects how some people think. Now, let's put it in context. I mean, that type of thing was in 2013 at just at the start of social media. Nobody really understood social media out of the power of it. Now, this is a very interesting statistic, and that was the third most sold book in the world is The Sorcerer's Stone by um, J.K. Rowling's. Okay, there's the, 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 Harry Potter. There's the Bible, then yeah. Mao, and then the story, it's fascinating when you think about that. 14% of people gave it a one star and said it was the worst book they'd ever written. So if you kind of think about any subject or any line that anybody says about anything, you can assume at the very minimum you're going to get 14%. Now, that was a great book. So let's say the average is 22 to 23% of people are going to be venomously opposed to anything that anybody says about anything. Listen, I, I don't think, though, that we should 
first of all, I don't want to harp on this too much, but <laughs> seeing something about you know yoga pants and writing Harry Potter are you know are different. That if fourteen percent of people who read Harry Potter don't like it, you know that that may be the case. But I guess it you know to, to make it a little bit bigger. I'm betting that you must have a sense that you're taking a risk. You're 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 making a bet that by that by saying kind of what you want about um, bodies or uh, the, the the children lying on the bag or child labor, a bet that you're just going to be yourself and you're going to say what you want and you don't really care what's going to happen. I'm I'm sort of assuming that that must be like a a conscious gamble in your mind, or or at least it was then maybe. I don't think so. I think it's you know we it was the. 2013 was the entering of the stage of the world where um, where people couldn't have an opinion anymore. Uh, or I could have an opinion, but it didn't mean that people couldn't vehemently oppose to it verbally on a platform that would go global. I mean, before that, people said ideas all the time. What it is to be an entrepreneur is to have ideas that nobody else has. Is there anything, I know that you really orient yourself to the future. Is there anything about the past that you wish now that, that you could change? Some, something that you did or, or, or something that you, that you didn't do? Something that you said or something that you, that you didn't say? No, I'd say my only regret was I had total control of Lululemon 100%. It was a cash cow making a lot of money. I had three kids under the age of uh, two and I wanted to um, be a family man. So I, I sold to private equity and didn't really realize after selling to private equity that, you know, that people would, I was a very trusting type of person. And, you know, oh, it'll take us five years to go public. Well, it went public in a year. You know, everything that, uh, you know, they had promised me kind of flew out the window. And I, what really happened is I lost control of the board um, and I didn't have A and B class shares, which I could have, you know, easily asked for, and didn't didn't know I didn't have the right advice, which is my fault. And um, so, by not controlling the board, I lost the culture of Lululemon and the growth of where it, where I think it should be. So your big so your big professional regret is sell, selling to private equity guys and and losing losing control of your board of directors. No, my regret would more be like I didn't spend time developing relationships with advisors or calling people that had gone through the process before and really understanding you know what it is I needed to do mm -hmm. I think I also had surrounded me myself with advisors that were also very nice trusting Canadians you know and I think you know it's just that uh, private equity isn't set up to you know to tell you the whole truth about what's going to happen three or four years mm -hmm. down the road you, you felt you were naive oh very naive what do you want to say to people who are working retail jobs, maybe a job as a barista, a job, a job of the boss, and they, and they really crave doing their own thing, but feel like they, they don't have the resources or, or the capacity to, to actually try? What do, you, what do you want to tell them? Well, I think it comes back to what we've been talking about already. Like, do you want to be on your deathbed and go, I wonder if I would have done that or not? What's the point of living a life like that? I'm going to have two kids. I'm going to live in suburbia. At 60, I'm going to retire, become a road cyclist, and then I'm going to die. It was great because then I'd lived an entire life. If I would have like lived the life I'd already envisioned and then I died, that would be boring. Wait, Chip, where, <laughs> where does this idea of like the horror of, of a kind of like basic life come from? I mean, you, you asked like, what's the point of that? I mean, I can think of some reasons to do it. You know, like just like decency, you know, comfort, family. Like, spe yeah, spending time with people you love and enjoy, you know? I guess that's like a low stakes life, but I don't think it sounds as, as bad to me. It, it sounds like it, it kind of horrifies you. Well, it, it is interesting that I think everybody makes the life basically in reaction to something that happened when they were in a, their childhood. Yeah. And um, what you're talking about is a type of person who maybe had a very rough childhood and very chaotic childhood and in reaction to that, they want a very normal, safe, predictable life. Now, you could say I had a very chaotic childhood and everything, but I think my parents loved me, and I think that um, I was a firstborn child, and I was kind of whatever my genetic makeup is or anything, I wasn't ever going to be happy with the normal life. There are those of us uh, who have a boss and a boss's boss and sometimes a boss for that boss as well. But like, you know, 
we appreciate our paychecks and we like the stability of it, you know, um, a sense of certainty that it offers. Can you sell us on the idea of living life your way? Well, a leader is someone who creates a future that would otherwise not have happened. And a leader can be anybody. It can be the person, the maintenance person sweeping the floors, and it can be the CEO and everybody in between. I think you can have that life that you want to live, but it's important to be a leader to yourself. And, and so what does that leader do? He inspires and uh, loves other people and makes everyone around them attain their very, very best. Is it possible to have that, that life, a life of generosity and love? but without being a successful entrepreneur, just, just having a kind of stable job, maybe, maybe even in some ways, what might look to the ex outside world like a mediocre job? C could it be possible to sort of be successful in, in your book like that? A truly happy person is living in choice. So a choice, choice means um, not deciding. So a dis deciding to do something is kind of like suicide. You're cutting off choices, where choice is really about like coming up with four or five different possibilities for how life is uh, lived or almost how every moment is lived. And that's really only possible by again having that amnesia and letting the, the past go and creating the present from an unknown future. So I think as long as somebody is choosing the life that they're living and not doing it in reaction to their past, then they're living a fulfilled life. We're going to leave it there. Chip Wilson, Really enjoyed having you here. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Max. So okay, very good. You just watched an interview with a billionaire who goes from one very far out challenge to the next, kind of reshaping his present by reconceptualizing his future. But it turns out he has mixed feelings about the word moonshot. If you're the kind of person who aims extremely high professionally, Maybe you do too. Maybe you just do what you do. However, no matter how you feel about the word, when you take a moonshot, things do not go as planned. In fact, as you are about to see in the closing moments of our interview, things go to places that no one could have predicted. Take a look. We'll see you soon. Yes, I can remember the last time I was dishonest, and it, it actually makes me quite sick. I was being interviewed by the um, SEC, and I think I had to uh, um, say what wasn't true in order to, uh, how can I say this? Um, if I would have said what was true, then I would have spent three or four years in court, flying back and forth from Vancouver to, to who knows where in the United States. And I probably will have lost a billion dollars in stock value, but more so I just had three kids under the, at a very young age and I wasn't willing to be away from them. And that took more precedence over um, telling the truth. Will you just give viewers context of like, you know, you were, I, I was here at the time and they were asking about X. The viewers are going to be like, holy shit, what is he talking about? Will you just add in in full senses, like, j j just help orient viewers so they're not completely flummoxed by that? Uh, no, I won't. You're just going to leave it mysterious? Yeah. All right, well, I, I honestly want to know more. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do.